All right, so this, this is starting to create some volume. Now, what if I wanted to create some texture on this heart? So one way I could do that is by working on dry and using what they call a broken edge. So a broken edge is where your brush is not really wet, Okay, so um, here's an example, okay? So look at all the lost edges here. There's some definite crisp edges as well. And uh, you're gonna- Would you explain this... what a lost edge is? Because a lot of people might not know that term. Sure, a lost edge is an edge that basically um, disappears. So here, for example, we have an edge that just vanishes into thin air. Uh, so that's what they call a lost edge. And you're going to encounter those kind of edges in just about every kind of painting you're going to do. It doesn't matter if you're working in watercolor or if you're working in acrylic or anything like that. You're, you're going to encounter a combination of different edges. So like here, for example, look at, look at all the softness that goes through here. And yet look how crisp the, and defined some of these edges are. So where does your eye go? it goes right to where all those crisp edges are. So if you were listening to an orchestra and you had uh, you had uh, every, every instrument playing different uh, tunes at the same time, just as loud as each other, it wouldn't be much of a song. You have to have um, undulations, you have to have um, high points and low points, soft and quiet. And we need to have that in our painting too. So our paintings tell a story. And we need to have those combinations. Uh, so there's a lot of things that uh, uh, soft and hard edges are going to give us. We all pretty much know how to do a hard edge. We just paint on dry paper. There you go, hard edge, right? All works. So the thing that you want to do though, is you want to have um, some soft edges. So you've got resting places. So you've got areas that flow through your painting and so on. Uh, create distance, create motion, um, create texture. There's so many reasons for having uh, crisp and hard edges. You know, sometimes you have an object and you just want it to disappear. And that, again, it's another lost edge. So, you know, you have all kinds of reasons for having lost and hard edges. Uh, we've got, uh, sometimes it creates the feeling of light. Look here, we've got this window and look how the tree appears to get skinny. Let me zoom out a little bit here. Look how the tree uh, appears to get a little bit skinny in the middle here. And that's because the light is blurring out those edges. So we need to learn how to do this in watercolor, right? And I could go through example after example, but, um, you know, here we have different textures. We have, for example, this is a chocolate, right? And it's got a little shine to it, but this is a silver wrapper and it's got a lot of shine to it. So here we have all these hard edges and here we have a soft edge. So you need to know the right application for using these edges. Okay, so I could go through a whole stack of paintings here and I'll, I won't do that, but just so that you, um, so that you know I understand where you're coming from if you're, you know, just sort of starting out in watercolor or whatever, I dug up a couple of my early watercolors. <laughs> so these are gonna be fun. All right, so some of my early watercolors are, I'm almost embarrassed to show these. <laughs> <laughs> but here we go. Okay, so little little studies. This isn't quite in focus yet. There we go. All right, there we go. Didn't know much about edges when I painted this. <laughs> I don't know how many years ago this was, but it was a long time ago. And no, I wasn't a child. <laughs> so I have I have. Oh, look at this one. This is a, a butte. <laughs> so yes, you know when people say, "Oh, you're so talented," I wish I were. Uh, but I actually worked at it for many years. Uh, so that's actually where I started. That might be where you are now. <laughs> and if it is, uh, don't be disheartened because you can get there. And I'm going to just 
give you a little bit of an illustration of how to go from that to something like this, where we have you know, lots of crisp edges here and these softened edges here. Um, first thing, I guess, is noticing where they are in your painting, in your reference picture. But uh, I'm just going to set this aside. And I'm going to pull up a piece of paper here. I'm going to give you a little exercise that you can do to, um, to train yourself to work on your edges and to work on your water control. I, I think one of the things that we run into all the time is we, we grab a reference photo and then, you know, we stretch a piece of paper and we bought the best materials and we and so on. And all of a sudden, this piece of paper is very precious because we want a whole painting to turn out. And we don't give ourselves enough time to actually practice the techniques. So if I was sitting down to play the piano, uh, I would practice some scales. Yeah, they're kind of boring, but they're worth practicing because that's what makes your songs or your music really work. And we, need, we don't do that enough in watercolor, especially watercolor, but in all mediums for that matter. It's just practice the techniques. I see lots of people and they, they take, uh, you know, they'll do all kinds of uh, color charts or they'll do gray scales and that sort of thing, but those are all hard edges. It's the soft edges we always struggle with, right? So um, learning to control that in watercolors is kind of a big deal. So I'm just going to take one piece of paper uh, and one simple shape, one simple shape. And I'm just going to work with this shape. I'm going to see how many different ways I can create this shape. We want to know what kind of paper you're painting on and yeah. uh, what, your, what your brushes are. Okay, so I'm using Arches 140 pound cold press paper. That's the paper that I use most of the time. My brushes, I am using, this one's a uh, three-quarter inch faux Kalinske by Dynasty, and I've got another one. It's a squirrel hair brush, a number 10 by Baya Elk. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but uh, Baya Elk. Most of my uh, palette here is Da Vinci watercolors, but I'm really just going to work with one color for this exercise. And why one color? It's because I want to eliminate all the variables. I, I, I don't want to start throwing in different colors, combinations, and mixing color, and all of that sort of thing. I just want to focus on edges. That's all I want to work on here. So I'm going to use this sheet of paste paper. I'm going to make it basically a, a throwaway if I want. You know, don't make it precious. As soon as you take out a reference picture, this becomes precious. So let's just practice this technique so that when we actually go to work on our painting, we can actually do it. So I'm going to start off with uh, just one color here, I'm, and I'm going to use a very simple heart shape. So I'm going to I'll zoom in a little bit here. There we go. So I'm going to wet this. You can see that there's quite a lot of shine on here, right? And I'm going to take some permanent rose, and I'm just going to get it pretty wet, and I'm going to try to paint that heart shape in here. All right, so if I try to paint a heart shape, well, and my brush is really wet, you can see um, that it's kind of exploding. It's not really maintaining its shape. So that helps me to understand what's going to happen if I go into really wet surface with really wet paint. Now, what if I took the same wet surface and my paint wasn't so wet? So I'm going to take this and go just as wet, and I'm going to take the same paint, but I'm going to blot my brush. Take some of that moisture up, right? So I'm blotting like this belly part of my brush, and I'm going to paint into this. And, oh, I have more control. It's not exploding like the other one did. So that has already taught me that by blotting my brush is giving me some control, that the paint being a little drier than the, the surface is allowing the paint, 
it's giving me a little bit more control. So half of watercolor is understanding the medium. Uh, sometimes this is exactly what I want. Sometimes this is what I want. Uh, if I were to do a background and I wanted it really looking far away and blurry, I might go very wet into very wet. I might go damp into very wet if I just want a little bit of softness. Now, there's other ways of achieving this. And one is that I can paint on dry and then soften my edges, right? So I can paint on dry here, same heart, and I'm trying to keep it all pretty consistent in size and everything, just so that there's no variables, just everything's kind of the, on the same playing field. So I'm gonna rinse my brush and blot it again. And I'm going to see if I can soften some of these edges. Now, as I soften edges, I'm not going around with my brush like this. People like to hold the brush a lot like a pen. Let's come from the outside. Just lay that brush down at kind of a little bit of an angle here. And I'm just gonna catch the edge of this, this heart here. And we're gonna see what happens if I just take a, a straight shape like that, worked on dry and soften the edges by dampening only the edges. So this was painted on dry, but now I'm softening edges. So there's a lot of ways of going about this, but they give you different results. So by practicing, this gets you not only familiar with your paints and materials and your brushes, uh, but it helps you to learn the uh, characteristics of your paint and your paper and everything else. So what I'm using is fine, because that's what I'm using all the time. So don't do your practice on um, like a like a piece of paper that you would never use for a painting. It, you should be practicing on the same paper that you would use for your painting because it's amazing when you switch papers that you, uh, oh, you're trying it. <laughs> awesome, Eric. <laughs> well, um, when, you, uh, when you switch papers, you have to switch your painting style. Imagine um, getting used to driving your uh, little Toyota or whatever you drive, and then you hop into a, a, an 18 wheeler. Well, it's gonna be completely different and papers are just about that different from each other. <laughs> you get huge differences between paper. By the way, those, those early paintings that you saw that I, that I shared, <laughs> they, they were done on terrible paper with um, student quality paints and it isn't any wonder that I was struggling to get some of the softness. I would suggest 100% cotton paper uh, for, for any of this to work properly. Now, I didn't soften this as well as I would like, so I'm gonna come back into this. And my brush is nicely blotted. I'm gonna show you what happens if I come in and my brush is too wet. My brush is wetter than the paper. Okay, so if I don't blot my brush, and I come in to soften this edge. This is what's going to happen. The wet paint is going to push back at the dry. And then I'm going to get hard line. Because it's going to create a blossom. So this, this sort of practice is going to really help you get to know your paper, get to know your paints, get to know your brushes. Try this again with a different brush. Maybe the brush you're using doesn't hold enough paint or water, and, or maybe maybe it holds too much. Uh, try even, even a different paper towel can absorb less or more. Uh, but get to know your materials because I find that people always, like I often have students and they'll say, I'll ask them what kind of paper they're working on and they go, I don't know, <laughs> just something I had in my pile. And they don't even know what they're working on. So they're struggling and they don't know why. And it's, it's not always your fault, which is good news, right? Because we so often blame ourselves. But understanding um, is, is very much the thing. Now, these are great. Th these are different ways of getting this. And of course, probably don't even need to demonstrate how to paint on dry because painting on dry is, a, is pretty straightforward. You just paint on dry and let it dry, let the paint dry. And you have these nice crisp edges. 
All right, so that's edges in its most basic form, right? Then we have to start incorporating a little bit more into this. So um, what I want to achieve on this paper is I want to see how many different ways I can create a heart. And uh, some of them will be successful, some of them will not be, but this is what the whole exercise is about. And who cares? It's a, it's a throwaway piece of paper. Uh, I mean, you can even do this on the back of a failed painting or something like that. It, it doesn't really matter. So, um, all right. So now let's, let's try to give this heart some shape. All right. So we need to start um, creating a little bit of uh, volume to this. So I'm going to come around the outsides of this heart. like this. And now I'm going to soften the inside. All right, so I'm softening, I blotted my brush and I'm softening the inside. And you'll notice I change direction with my brush as I'm doing this. All right, it's not just hold your brush at one angle and it fits all angle, all, all sides of the uh, shape, right? doesn't work that way. Um, I'm basically, by laying your brush down in front of a, something that's wet, a damp brush, it's just going to dampen that area a little bit so that the paint will sort of, it'll entice that paint to come out. Uh, too much water in your brush is going to push the paint back. So that's why you get all these variations. So I'm going to soften this up a little bit more. I see some of it. So I'm keeping an eye on these things too, right? I'm watching it. And if it's not softening the way I want, I blot my brush a little more and give it another little tickle. All right, so this, this is starting to create some volume. Now, what if I wanted to create some texture on this heart? So one way I could do that is by working on dry and using what they call a broken edge. So a broken edge is where your brush is not really wet. It's a little bit blotted. And I'm going to lay it down at like a 30 degree angle or 45 degree angle, somewhere in there. And I'm going to lay my brush down and get these broken edges on this heart. So it's using the side of my brush here. That's what's giving me this texture. What's happening is actually the, the paint is... The brush is skipping over the texture on the paint, and it's only leaving the paint on the peaks, right? So I can create this. probably easier for me to turn this around to work this way because I've got this weird angle, and I am right-handed. So I'm turning my work around as I do this. All right. And, and if I wanted to fill in my heart with texture, I just use the side of my brush there. All right, so that, that's a type of edge as well. A broken edge. How about a shiny heart? Okay, so a shiny heart. Things that are shiny are ha have a very crisp highlight. So I'm going to go ahead. This is a nice sort of soft heart, kind of like that chocolate painting I showed you. And I'm going to do a really shiny heart now, as if it were a mylar balloon or something like that. All right, so I'm going to come around. And I'm going to paint this on dry. Anybody else painting along with me besides Eric? <laughs> All right, so we've got a very shiny highlight on this. Very crisp. I'm not going to soften it. I'm just going to leave this, this very bright highlight here. All right, that looks shiny. Now I could take it further and and put shadow on it and everything else. And I would put the shadow on this by layering what I did over here. I would put that around the outsides. Can't hear you, Eric. I said, let's do it. I want to see this. <laughs> <laughs> Shade it? 
Yeah, put a shadow in it. What the heck? All righty. All, All right. right. I'll go I'll go a little bit darker red. I'm going to pick up some alizarin crimson. I've been using permanent rose, and I'm just going to use a little bit of alizarin crimson. It's still a little bit damp, but I'm going to come in here. My earbuds keep falling out. <laughs> they never stay in my ears for some reason. I must have weird-shaped ears. Now, I'm coming into this with paint that is drier than my surface. So I've had to blot my brush and make sure that my paint isn't really wet. Otherwise, I won't have any control. All right, so I've gone around the outside with some darks. Well, you mentioned the name of the brush you're using again. And somebody said it's a non-Kalinsky? Correct. It's not a Kalinsky. It's a squirrel hair brush. Squirrel hair. And um, I can zoom in so you can see it because I don't, I don't even know the correct pronunciation. Uh, there we go. It's called Baya Elk. Where do you get them? Uh, I ordered it online, actually, through, through a website called um, AliExpress. But i got to soften this before we get sidetracked here. And that's what happens a lot in watercolor. We get sidetracked. <laughs> so i got to stick to the task at hand here. We're softening this edge, so I've got to get in the hair right away. And it's already kind of pulling it up because I talked too long there. Oh, so timing. Timing's a big thing, right? All right, so now we have a little bit of shading on our heart. Um, I could have gone on probably a darker red than that even, but, uh, but that gave me something. And at least it gives you, you know, some idea of how, how I achieved that, um, that heart-shaped chocolate. All right, so let's say I want to create the feeling of motion. All right, so if I want to create the feeling of motion... I'm going to start off with a hard edge, another hard edged heart here. You are going to learn so much about your watercolors just with this simple exercise. Um, and keeping everything the same shape just really makes you notice what the variations actually are. Um, there we go. Just going to move this to the side here so I can see what's going on a little bit better. There we go. And all right, so I've got this in here. It's still pretty wet. All right, so I'm going to take a brush that is drier than my surface. This time I'm going to use that flat brush. See this flat brush? I'm going to blot it. I'm going to take quite a bit of the moisture out of it. And I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to give it a little bit of a sweep like this. All right, so that's giving me the feeling that that part is zooming, like it's moving, right? But I think I want to soften this a little bit more. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rinse this brush once again. Once again, I'm going to blot it, and I'm going to come backwards at it. Hopefully, I can do this so you can see it, Maybe if I do it at this angle. Um, and I'm going to come back towards here. I'm going to rinse it again and come back in. And I can soften that edge. So that heart looks like it's kind of zipping through space, right? It's it's in motion. I could create a another way of creating this the same type of thing would be to paint my heart once again on dry. Paint's pretty wet here, and I don't know. I'm going to shift. I'm going to lift it up a bit here so you can see the shine. You see how much paint is on there? Like how much wet paint is on there? For me, that's a little too wet to try to soften because what happens is it's going to come flying out 
of um, out of this puddle, out of this shape, and really travel. So I'm going to wait and get my brush. I'm going to wait for some of this shine to go away a little bit, and then I'm going to um, soften one edge, just one side of it, and it'll have a similar feeling where it's kind of moving. And if I do this with a flat brush, like this flat brush instead of the round brush, I, I'm actually following the contour with the round brush. But if I use a flat brush, I can do it kind of like, um, more like a cast shadow. You know how cast shadow just kind of goes on one angle because of the, the light source. It just hits one angle only. Um, so I can do it that way. And I'm blotting this really well. And let's give this a go here. So I'm using this corner of my brush, and I'm going to soften this edge. My brush is blotted enough that it is um, not making too much of that pull out. It's just softening that one edge. You're a good teacher. Oh, thanks. I, I, I teach a lot. <laughs> so thank you. All right. So now that's, that heart also kind of looks like it's in motion and it's moving. So I'm able to create that uh, through that. Now, what I could do is I could keep going, try all kinds of experiments on this page and just try wet on wet, dry on dry, damp on damp. Um, and one of, the, one of the other hearts that I didn't do yet, um, and that is, and I use these two brushes together a lot because I find that this one's great for getting my paper wet uh, or damp. And it's knowing how wet or damp uh, makes a difference. So the way I like to control watercolor is paper towel, gosh, I don't know what I would do without paper towel. <laughs> I'm going to blot. Now, I don't mean just take the tip of your brush and do this. You need to lay the side of your brush because this is where all the water is trapped, right in this middle part, the belly. So I'm going to blot the side of my brush. And I'm going to dampen this area. Let's do this corner here. I'm going to dampen this spot. Now you'll see, if I hold this up, you'll see it has a little bit of, it has a little bit of shine to it, but it's not nearly as wet as what we did before. Like even catching the shine there, just a little bit. It's kind of a satin sheen, right? So having a good light nearby to see exactly the shine on your paper can be a very helpful thing in knowing timing of your painting. So I'm going to pick up my paint. What do I have to do? This is a quiz, Eric. What do I have to do? <laughs> I don't know. What, are, what, are, what do you have to do? I have, I have to blot. A blot. It. Yeah, that's right. You got to blot. Because if I don't blot, I'm going to overwhelm this spot and I won't have any control. So I'm going to blot it so that my brush won't be as, uh, as wet as the paper. Here we go. So you can't really see too much of the uh, the softening, but it is there. Are you there, Eric? I'm here. Oh, okay. I would just want to make sure. So um, I'm just busily painting. Good, good. Oh, I want to see your result. Oh, you don't want to see it. It's a, it's a test. <laughs> All right, so so I've come in on a only a damp surface, so I can I can really control how. Stay in focus, camera. Uh, I can really control how um, gentle that edge is. If it doesn't do what I want, sorry, it doesn't like it when I'm zoomed in quite as close as I am zoom out a little bit. Did you say you were painting that on damp or not damp? 
damp. That's what I, I took the flat brush and I dampened the area first to get that sort of satin sheen. And once I got the satiny sheen, I came in with a blotted brush. So this is what they call damp on damp or what I call damp on damp. I don't know what anybody else calls it. But that's what I call it. Damp on damp. And so if it doesn't do quite what you want, because I mean, let's face it, in a perfect world, nothing's going to happen exactly the way you want it, especially in watercolor and especially if you're just learning. So if I blot my brush one step further, I can take this and go just tickle these edges. See how I'm laying my brush on an angle and just tickling these edges? Now, remember what happened up here when I came in with a brush that was too wet and it made that blossom? So... You have to make sure, you have to remember to blot your brush to soften these edges. Your brush needs to be drier than the paper, not wetter. I'll tell you, this is excellent. I mean, this this is very basic, but it's very important. And, and I, I'm, I'm learning things I've never known. Well, good. Yeah. I know it's not the most exciting <laughs> demo, but I know we have such a limited amount of time. Like block and tackle, and it's blot and tickle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ken, Ken Grody in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, technical terms. <laughs> Lots of technical. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but these are the things you really need to know in order to get to the kind of painting that I do. And, and just, you know, as a heads up, I spend a lot of time working on those types of paintings. And uh, so, let me zoom out so you can see this whole page at the moment. Right, there we go. So you can see all the different effects um, that you can get with different types of edges. Uh, and like this one kind of looks like a rock shaped heart or a uh, heart shaped rock, I should say. Yeah. And um, you know, it's got all this cool texture on it and everything else. And it's all just, a lot of it has to do with the angle of your brush, like not just always painting with the tip, um, making sure that you you have the right consistency, not only on the in the paint, but the right moisture on the surface. And that's why that's why practicing these techniques is so important. Because if you sit down to create a painting out of this, and things don't go your way, well, you get discouraged. Right. So practice, 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 um, you know, consider this scales. <laughs> OK, so what I want to do after this is I'm just going to I'm going to give you a list of pros and cons for each of these edges, because if you don't know how to use them or why to use them, it's not very helpful. So okay. let me just. Let me just go back here for a second. All right. and I'm first, first going to give you a list of hard edges. Okay, so what are they good for? They're, they're good for creating definition and detail, and you can always take a screenshot of these if you want to. Um, it, it draws attention. As I pointed out with that cloud, where does your eye go? Right where that cl cloud had those hard edges. Uh, broken edges. Well, our, our little heart here has these broken edges, and it can create great textures. Um, you know, if you were doing rocks and things like that, use the side of your brush and create broken edges. Um, if you were doing something like a, a box, you know, a, a hard edge, you would use a hard edge to describe that uh, sudden change in plane, you know, where it goes from being horizontal to be, being vertical. Um, and as I pointed out in, in our um, little shiny heart here, they can make something look like it has a shiny surface and as you probably know I do a lot of glass painting and so that uh, <laughs> that that one I use a lot but I do use a combination so the list for soft and soft is definitely harder all right the list for soft is longer so get your screenshot and then we're moving on here <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so here's here's the soft edges. Oh, so, that's a big list. Yeah. Um, so when you want to create things like atmosphere or fog or create distance, soft edges is the way to go. Um, 
it can create a feeling of motion, as we pointed out with our zooming heart. Um, it can it can also create a mood, like um, it can feel a little bit calm or um, somber, maybe if you have soft edges. Uh, you know, if you had if you imagine a painting of say New York City, which is all hard edges and signs and and all of that kind of stuff, well, that that gives you a whole different feeling of activity and, and action and all that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, if you're creating a, a feeling of calmness, you don't want to have a hard, lot of hard edges. You want to go for the soft. Um, and it's definitely great for creating contours. I mean, the shape of anything for that matter, an apple or a, a leaf of a, a leaf or a um, petal or a heart, <laughs> as we did earlier. Um, and it's definitely a way to go if you want to simplify busy areas of your painting. You know, sometimes uh, you have uh, a floral and it's in a garden and you've got a million different flowers. And actually, I want to talk about that for a second, especially those of you that do plein air painting. Because if you're a plein air painter, here's the problem. You sit down and you draw this out and then you paint your main subject. Let's, let's say it's a, a house. Okay, so you paint the house. Now you want to paint the trees. So what do you do? You shift your gaze to the trees. Now your eyes are actually focusing on trees. And the tendency is to want to paint the trees in focus. Um, so if you find that all your paintings are looking kind of stiff and, and kind of rigid and cut out and all that kind of thing, try, try focusing on your main subject and painting basic peripheral, like use your peripheral vision uh, to paint the um, trees and the background and stuff. Just try it once, you know, just do it in a little sketchbook or something. Just see what happens. And you'll find that if you paint things that are out of focus, um, that it, it creates more um, dimensions, like background, foreground, and so on. And it sure helps the eye know where to look. Um, all right. So, uh, it helps the eye flow through the paintings. People often forget this, and you think that you always need to define things, and um, you'll see this a lot in watercolor portrait painters that will basically let edges, like say the edge of hair or something, just sort of blend into the background. And it's that lost edge thing that I was talking about earlier. You have an example, uh, you had a bunch of paintings there. Do you have an example possibly of a landscape that would show that principle? Sure. Okay. Good idea. Okay. So you need to move the other thing off your screen. I will. Yeah. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay. So here's a good example where um, I wanted the focal point to be the falls. So the falls have these nice crisp edges here, right? Lots of crisp edges here. These trees are a little bit more in focus, but these ones are out of focus. Like, see how blurry they are. Um, also, the water in the foreground, it's very kind of blurry and out of focus. Lots of soft edges here. So there's no question what you're looking at here. If I were to paint these trees all in focus and this water all in focus, and I'm looking at this, I wouldn't know where to look. Well, and that's uh, that painting you showed when you were uh, learning the house. That, <laughs> everything, everything in that painting was in focus. Oh, absolutely. I know. It was dreadful. <laughs> oh, it was, well, everybody starts somewhere. but I know. But I, it's cringeworthy when you look back on these things. <laughs> and unfortunately, I, I actually have thrown out a lot of that early stuff because I, I just ugh, looked at it. But you know what? Hang on to one or two of them because it's a great way to, to know whether or not you're actually progressing. Yeah. Right? That's so, right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to bring that list up for a second here. Um, so, um, yeah, so that this is that that instance of producing blur to uh, separate the foreground, middle ground, and background. And in this case, where I had the waterfall, it was in the middle ground. So that's what I wanted you to look at. Sometimes it's the foreground. Sometimes it's the background. But often it's the middle ground. Um, yeah, it has less visual weight, which is why it helps you focus on other areas, right? But it also really helps to connect elements in your painting. If you separate everything with hard edges, 
it just looks like a jigsaw puzzle, right? Where you just got all these piece, separate pieces that have been stuck together. And uh, so it's, it's really important. So I'm just gonna give you that quick rundown of the techniques that we used. So we've got um, the hard edges, the soft edges, the blurred edges, and a combination. Now that's one I actually didn't demonstrate. So how about if I just show that? Because that's that's a okay. really important one that we use a lot, right? So okay. you can actually put that one we've, down. We've so got about, let's say three or four more minutes. Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna take this out of the way here. Come back to my demonstration here. And I'm going to paint my paint my heart. Fill up my brush a little bit more here. All right, so I'm going to paint this this heart. Now, if I want to lose some of these edges, or if I want to uh, have a combination of hard and soft edges. I'm going to rinse this brush. And what am I going to do? Blot. <laughs> you got it. So I'm going to blot. And I'm just going to come along here and let some of that just run out into the background. I did actually didn't blot it quite enough. Let's get this wetter. All right, so I'm going to lose this edge just with a clean brush. And let's lose another edge here. Just come in here and just let that kind of disappear. And so don't be afraid to do that. Yes, it's a heart shape, and you still know it's a heart shape, right? Like you can tell it's a heart. So there's something in our, um, we are hardwired, I guess, to, to think that we have to um, experience describe everything with perfectly crisp lines. Uh, and it's so not the case. Uh, let things flow into each other. Um, experiment and just do do one painting. Just make a little sketch or something. Do one painting and deliberately blur an edge that you wouldn't normally blur. Okay. Um, Got to get that's out of that assignment. comfort zone. That's our assignment for today. There you go. <laughs> Shelly, I'm curious. Uh, you said something about you know a clean, clean water, clean brush. Do you uh, have two cups of water, one where you clean your brush out, and another that's clean, or how do you? How Absolutely, do you... I, I have a, a dirty and I have a clean. Right? Okay. Can you see in, up here in the top right I hand do, corner? Yeah, yeah uh -huh. I've got so I've got both. Um, now, one other thing I want you to try is different pigments, because different pigments. Pigments, as you know, are, are ground up into a powder and then they're combined with you know, gum arabic or they're combined with oil, they're combined with polymer, um, but, you know, to create the different mediums and so on. But different um, pigments have different weights. So some pigments will um, settle into the paper. They have actually more weight, so it settles more like grains of sand into your paper. So you try it again with, with a granulating um, pigment, you know, something like a, an ultramarine. Uh, try it. Uh, okay, now a lot of these softening techniques, think about whether or not your paint is a staining color. Now, staining color is a color that once you put it down, you try to lift it off, it doesn't go away completely, it stains the paper. So some, some things that stain are like um, phthalos, for example, Thalo anything, thalo green, thalo blue, thalo, what else out there? There's all kinds of thalos, but um, they're, they're all pretty much staining colors. So some of these techniques won't work as well. So that's why I encourage you to try it and then try it with another pigment. Uh, but by keeping the same subject matter throughout, it really um, helps you to understand what those differences are um, in your technique not so much the paint or the paper or anything else. It's, it's all in your technique. And so this is a great exercise for just working on technique. Not the most exciting thing. Definitely agree, you know, definitely uh, 
concede to that, but, but it, it is going to be very helpful to you. All right. Yeah. This was great. Um, okay, so Shelly, awesome. tell us a little bit about your new video. Oh, my new video is it's great. It's uh, actually I have, uh, it's great. <laughs> I have I it's I love this um, particular subject, and this is something I always think about when I'm choosing a subject is uh, the light. The light uh, is what gives me those shadows, and the shadows, of course, give me those edges <laughs> that I have to worry about. So I will go go over a lot of, you know, how to create these textures and how to create the softness. Why does this background look like it's out of focus? How come I can't see the back of the cat? You know, and it allowed, what are you focused on here? You're focused on this part right here. Right. And um, it, it really goes into a lot of detail about uh, how I go about that and why I go about it. And, um, and things like that, including even stretching paper, really? which I think is very important. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, this has been fabulous, and congratulations on the new video. We're excited about it. Um, you can Thank find you. that at painttube.tv. I should point out to people that what we do on this program are often done with the artist phones and, and sound and so on, but what we do from our studio at Paint Tube TV is, you know, very high quality, high definition, extreme close-ups, you know sharp quality so professionally produced and so check out shelly's new video at painttube.tv and and check out shelly tomorrow we're going to do uh an example tomorrow uh at 3 p.m just right here on on facebook and youtube and others so shelly thank you so much for being on today it was a pleasure well, my pleasure pleasure's all mine i uh yeah. i painted along oh you did good yeah <laughs> love eric <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought if I put I love Shelly that we might cause rumors. I love it. Oh, so awesome. Yeah, so so you're doing a lot more watercolor nowadays. I right? am. I, I, I Actually, I'm doing more watercolor and pastel. And, and uh, it's because of these events like Watercolor Live and Pastel Live, which was last week. And uh, it's just got me enthusiastic. And, and it's informing all my work. Right. So I was painting in oil yesterday and I used some techniques that I picked up from watercolor. So it's things that you wouldn't think to, but um, after seeing these techniques, they make sense. So and, and your idea of edges here really applies to everything, of course, as you yeah, know. It, it does, no matter what your medium. And I do work in a lot of different mediums as well. You know, everybody thinks of me as a watercolorist, but I do work in oils and, and acrylics as well. Yeah. And blending those are a little bit different. Now, it's a piece of cake in in oil of course a little trickier in in acrylic i don't um, think it's but, even a piece of cake in oil sometimes i think it's hard uh well it's in in terms of the in rel stays, relatively to watercolor absolutely <laughs> yeah in terms of the paint staying workable it's it's easier that's for true sure. But, well, uh, you were a fabulous inspiration, a great teacher. Uh, this was a you. really wonderful segment today, and I think it's going to get a lot of play because it really it really puts a lot of things together. I was teaching someone watercolor last week, and I wish I had seen this because this would have helped me teach them better. So hopefully they'll see nice. it. Nice. <laughs> All right, Shelly, congrats okay. on the new video. I remind everybody Thank that you. you can get that new video at Paint Tube. Dot TV, and you can get it downloadable so you can watch it instantly today, or you can get it uh, for on a DVD if you, you want to do that. Some people are still doing that. So, Shelly, you're awesome. Thanks so much, and uh, Thanks, Eric. we will see you soon. Have you ever wondered how some artists get such realistic quality in their work? You know, unbelievably beautiful portraits, stunning figures, and realistic looking still lifes or florals? Painting or drawing realism takes your work to a whole new level. Whether you want tight, carefully rendered realistic paintings, or looser, more impressionistic realism, most high level artists will tell you that painting is a skill that anyone can learn. If you follow a process, you can paint beautiful, realistic artwork. But where do you learn? You could spend 3000 or more to attend a live workshop or convention. Or you can learn from the world's finest realists from home for a fraction of the cost. 
At Realism Live, the world's first virtual online realism conference, you'll get three days of world-class artists demonstrating their techniques and processes. This is a comprehensive conference covering all the subjects you want to learn in portraiture, figures, landscapes, still life, cityscapes, color mixing, and more. Taught by the world's leading artists. Not only will you learn their techniques, you'll have a chance to interact with instructors and get your questions answered. And you'll get to know other artists personally through our breakout sessions. And we'll even paint and draw together at the end of each day. Make new friends in our breakout sessions. Paint with hundreds of others. Get private access to our exclusive members group to become a part of our community. And learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Realism Live is three full days of painting and drawing instruction, November 10th through 12th. And for people who want to learn painting and drawing from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day, one day atelier on November 9th. Soon you'll be painting faces, people, flowers, scenery, objects, and other subjects. You'll see your artwork improve faster as you learn from top artists and instructors from all over the world. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together from these amazing artists. Glenn Vilpu, John Potoshenek, Alex Kelly, Ned Mueller, Terry Strickland, Dustin Van Welchel, Lisa Egwe, Clyde Aspavig, Sarah Sedwick, Rose Franson, Michelle Dunaway, Michael Midler, Daniel Graves, Leona Shanks, Alexander Shanks, Juliet Aristides, Carol Peebles, Todd M. Casey, Cornelia Hernes, Sandra Angelo, Oliver Sin, Sharon Sprung, Mario Robinson, Deborah Hughes, Zinya Gershman, and Alicia Shanks, and Karen Offit. And it's hosted by fine art connoisseur and publisher Eric Rhodes and editor in chief Peter Trippi. And if you can't watch live, you can watch replays on your own time for up to a year. And it's 100% guaranteed. You'll be pleasantly surprised to realize just how much you can learn in such a short time. Realism Live, from the publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. Sign up today to reserve your seat now 